Hi, and welcome to another To Catch Up with myself and the crystal, Christina, to catch. Hi, Christina, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good to have you back again. This is the third time now that we've had this little get together for a, to catch up, as I like to call it. It's becoming quite a thing now. Um, just wanted to sort of catch up with you and see what you've been up to. How's your game improving? Just basically what you've been up to. So how have you been since our last little chat? What have you been up to? Playing pool. Surprise. Right. Uh, <laughs> nothing really much has changed. Um, keep practicing. I was giving um, probably the whole month of August a lot of lessons because there was no tournaments and I was getting ready myself. So I tried to stay busy while Fado was traveling all over the places. <laughs> um, yeah, and then now it's it's a busy season. I've played two tournaments so far and leaving next week for World Tendal Championships in Austria. And unfortunately, uh, straight pool, American straight pool got canceled this year. And I'm going to play in Wolfers tournament in Virginia and then International Nine Bowl, Puerto Rico. And then I'll be back home well, end of November. Well, quite a trip then. So the last time we talked, I think you just played Wisconsin. Did you play in the Texas? Did you play in Texas? Uh, you well, uh, so you just mentioned Fedor's obviously traveling all around, runner up at the US Open, done really, really well there. He's going well again at the moment in uh, Vietnam, of course. I've just seen a post. He's been at a really cool ballroom today called Tom's or something. Do you, are you missing him? I do. Yeah. You do, yeah. Do you talk every day? Do you talk regularly? Do you, yeah. Yeah, we talk every day. So is, is there do you talk about Paul and his and you know how he's doing and or is it more personal stuff that you're talking about and basically the boyfriend and girlfriend stuff, huh? Depends, yeah. I mean, we talk obviously about pool a lot because it's a huge piece of both of our lives. Um, and then he was telling me how huge pool in Vietnam is and everywhere he goes, he got recognized. Um, like sushi bar, barber shop, <laughs> hotels, everywhere he, he goes, people like, oh, I'm sub subscribed for your YouTube channel. That's crazy uh, how many people actually play pool in Vietnam. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I've been to Vietnam now three times to play pool. And the scene out there is is just crazy. I've never been to Hanoi, but I've been to the Ho Chi Minh City before three times. And it's massive there as well. And it seems like there's new pool rooms opening up all the time now I mean I don't get recognized when I go oh, look, I've just been to the barbers I never got I never got recognized when I went to the barbers why should I <laughs> so um yeah, I've just been watching the, the last event you were in was the Iron City the Invitational too mm -hmm. Kelly won it once again um tell us about that tournament how you felt there did you feel you were playing good Actually, um, probably it's the first tournament when I didn't win, but still felt really proud of myself because I lost my very first match to April and I just couldn't get it going. And a lot of weird things was happening during the match. And, you know, April is, is uh, my sweet friend. We've been mm -hmm. friends for 10 years, actually. We, we just celebrated our university this year. <laughs> and... <laughs> Ten years. Yeah. How did you know? Have to, how have you known her for ten years on the junior scene? Or so we've met in Shanghai, China, for the World uh, Nine Ball Juniors. Uh, exactly ten years ago it was two thousand thirteen. So that's crazy, actually, to think about it. How long we know each other? Wow. So, yeah, and um, I can't say I played bad. I mean, I made a couple mistakes. Obviously, I'm not supposed to make. But it's just everything went like this way, you know, and 
I lost my first match and I had to play nine matches <laughs> to get wow. back. And I was uh, I was very proud of myself because I was kind of down. Like I've never lost my first game in a WPB tournament. And for the past year, I haven't lost anyone but Wei Wei, Kelly, and Allison. Not a single person. Like if I would lose, it would be them basically. So um, I I felt a little, a little down on myself, but then I I was I managed to regroup myself to you know um, get a right mentality about focusing on the process on my game things that I can actually control instead of trying to win the tournament or trying to focus on you know something I can't control. So I was very happy that I was uh, able to just calm myself down and go get the work done. So, and obviously, you know, I, I, I found my rhythm and I played pretty good against uh, Wei Wei, Cal, uh, Christina and uh, Allison. Um, I mean, obviously I've, I've made a couple of mistakes, but here and there, but overall I played pretty consistent, I would say. Was it? Yeah. Was it? Um, did you lose to Margaret in the last? Was it? What? Yeah. No. Was it Margaret? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, she seems to be playing really well. She seems to have gone up a gear just recently in the last couple of tournaments. Do you notice anything that she's doing differently than she did before? I mean, uh, she she broke pretty good on the table that we played because I. Um, I couldn't figure out the break on the TV table because I usually do a cut, cut break, and it just it just didn't work. And the same with Callie. I was talking to her uh, after my match with uh, Wei Wei, uh, or with my match with Margaret. Sorry. And yeah, I said that I just I just couldn't figure out the break. It just cut doesn't work, and I haven't been practicing a lot of the one ball square break. You know, because I. Cut, do a cut. Was so, it one on the spot? One of yeah. the spot. Have you been watching? I don't know. We've been watching today. Ko Ping Chung. Uh, he played against John Mora earlier on today in the semi-final of uh, Qatar. And ten ball, isn't it? Sorry. I think it's a ten ball, isn't it? No, no, nine ball. They're playing it's... nine ball, one on the spot, and maximum two winner breaks, but only two. Two breaks, then it goes back to your opponent for two breaks, unless they win it, obviously. Yeah, you can only win two in a row. And then if it goes if it goes to heel heel, then you have to win by two racks. And then if it I know. And then if it then if it's goes to 12-12, you then lag. And then the winner of the lag gets to break in the in the deciding rack. It's it's kind of complicated. It's a it's a, a WPA event actually there in Qatar. There's quite a few. There's a lot of people there. Uh, look, I don't want to really get into this too much because I don't really like controversy or anything like that. And I know you don't. And I'm not trying to get you to talk about something you don't want to talk about. But it's can't be ignored. Of course, there's lots in the news at the moment about WPA matchroom and the Asian federations and, and things like that. Um, I know Alison was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago I saw, and she was talking about there not really being any women's events for matchroom, but she can still understand why both parties are doing what they're doing. I mean, you don't, I don't think you do play any more matchroom events, do you? You haven't played one recently, have you? I I mean, I've tried. I wanted to go to Germany, uh, European Open, but I thought I'm going to play China Open and I wanted to get ready for that event instead of going to Germany and then go back home and then go to China. But I never got invited, right? <laughs> so, um, Mm. And then I wanted to play US Open and then they scheduled the tournament in Alabama for WPBA. So it just, you know, and then I could go to Vietnam, but again, it's better for me to stay home, get ready for the World Temple. And it's just the timing was bad for this year. Obviously, I could go 
uh, to some other events, but uh, yeah, it just it just didn't work out. What What about if they make you choose? What What do you think players will do? I'm not, maybe not necessarily yourself, but you have, you can talk about yourself. Uh, I, mean, I understand men. I understand men who are going to stick with Matchroom because. Uh, personal me, right? Me and Fetter talking about that issue. Uh, well, I understand the WPA point as well. I understand both of those points. And I think they are both wrong because uh, it's not right to make players to choose if you can't agree because all we do here is just trying to make money. And I understand that, well, we can stick to certain federation, but what's the point if you don't make money? What's the point in a kids' world championships if professionals not making money? So it's just not making sense for me. And I think our sport been struggling a lot to, you know, go through and start making at least hundred thousand a year, at least. So you're not feeling ashamed to say you're a professional pool player because, well, I can make money at least as, you know, more or less hardworking person in America. <laughs> So, um, but in the same time, you know, talking about us personally, me and Fatter, is, you know, all this issue with the war and the bans and it does like, it's, I'm just getting so sick of all this situation where I have to get invited for the China Open, but I'm not getting invited because invitations go to the EPBF but we're still banned with EPBF. Well, if you know the issue WPA and your official government body, you're supposed to know what's going on. So you're supposed to contact us directly and say, hey, you get a spot because I'm top 16 in the world, but I'm not getting contacted. I make a post and they say, oh yeah, you're going to get invited, don't worry. And I never get invited. And then Federer wanted to play Qatar Open and he never got invited. He messaged like Qatar, he messaged WPA, he never got a response. So, okay, if Federer's going to like choose WPA, but then he can't play half events because you're simply not giving us any invitations. Like it's just personally me and Federer, right? I don't talk for uh, other players. So um, it's, it's just very complicated for us for the moment to, you know, manage all that together so obviously all women is going to stick to the world pool association because matchroom doesn't have any women events and obviously i mean you can be serious saying that i can make money in the world nine ball tour it's just for women it's not possible so i mean look for, for the majority of men it's not possible you know you you might get the odd surprise here and there but it's always the top 16 top 20 players that are winning these events and the, the rest of the, the players are, are not even making the money to cover their expenses, right? So I, I think it's 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 very sad. You're right in what you say. And just as Paul seems to be building itself up again, in comes something that throws a spanner in the works and all of a sudden is there's infighting between everyone. And I just hope and wish that everyone could just get on and let people choose. And at the end of the day, people should be allowed to choose where they want to go and play, right? I mean, this is what they say. Well, you can choose, but I just feel it's such a big shame, you know, uh, to make people, instead of making, for example, 200,000, now they're going to make 100 or 50. It's just not fair to players. And I understand it's not going to probably last forever, all these issues, I hope. But still, it's. I just think it's not right for us. And I understand the point that we have to, you know, do the right thing for the sport and blah, blah, blah. But I'm here right now trying to make my living playing pool. You know, I'm, I just, I know it's egoistic and very selfish, but that's life. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I wish I would fight for something and stick up together. But I think all players should stick up together and say, fuck you. <laughs> We're not going to choose anything unless you sit down and try to talk to each other, you know, and, and make a deal. So, there was, but obviously it's not going to There was talk of a player's union going to be starting up. I think it was, was it Darren Appleton was, was, 
um, quoted as being main one of the main guys in it, along with a couple of other people, I believe. That hasn't seemed to have happened. Do you think a players' union would help? At this point, I think no, because everything you know went too far, and I think probably ban is going to happen, and people players will have to decide. And I don't know. It's I don't think that players will stick up together and be union and sacrifice some kind of couple tournaments, which is a lot of money to fight for your rights, or I don't even know how to call it. <laughs> but I've I've heard some people say now. <laughs> Take this in the spirit it's meant in. I'm looking to get your opinion on it. A lot of people say, well, you know, if you're in another sport and you don't make money, it's because you're not good enough. So if you're not good enough and, you know, whatever, whatever job you are in in the world, if you're not good at your job, you don't get you don't either get the job or you don't get paid very much to do that job. Now, I know other sports is different because you can be the 200th best golfer in the world and you still can make really, really good money, right? The problem seems to be that tournaments are very top heavy. All the money's at the top. And then as you go down the list, but then, then on the other side of that coin is the fact that if you don't have big prizes, then you're not going to get the big players going for it. Well, What's the answer there, do you think? Is there a solution to that? Well, solution is to generally have bigger prize money and attract more people who would who will who will be willing to um, sponsor events. And obviously it has to be attractive for sponsors. And obviously I don't know much about promoting sports. I am not a marketing manager or, you know, I'm just here <laughs> expressing my opinion. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, there has to be something to make pool looks attracting for other players or other people, you know. And I think pool is, is already very beautiful and attractive game. But there are some things like, I don't know, the referees could be a very hot girls in the short skirts in my opinion this would attract viewership like in boxing or any other uh, whatever fighting arts you know i think it would be cool to see something like that for example or hot men with with six-pack chests right and stomachs <laughs> you know, it's, this is something this is why women like beach volleyball is such a <laughs> such a big sport you know and it's and it's true unfortunately but um you know, or I think, I don't know, obviously, uh, I don't want to say, oh, these people not doing the right thing or this federation not doing the right thing, because obviously we don't know a lot what's going on behind the scenes. And maybe they truly try to change and promote and everything. But uh, again, I just think that um, instead of cooperating, federations trying to you know, keep the power, both of the sides, everyone. I'm not saying, oh, you're the bad guy, you're the bad guy. No. It's, and, the, it's, and then, of it's, course, the trouble there, Christina, sorry to interrupt you, but the problem there is then you've got three different organisations, for example, all fighting for the power. You're diluting the sport three ways. So in, that's not going to attract the big sponsors to the game because they they see all this infighting and think well you know i want to if i put my million dollars into this tournament then i want it going to every federation and every player i want every player around the world playing in this tournament not just matchroom or wpa or the age well, you know whoever it might be I, i've just had a thought actually i believe i found the perfect person to head the organization to help pool players and it's your it's your other half and he can even call it the federation <laughs> yeah. you know you know he's, he's the most famous person on the planet at the moment for pool 
okay, maybe SVB as well, but SVB, I guess his years are coming to the end. Feder Gorst, young, good looking guy, brilliant for sponsors. He's a clean living. He's got a lovely girlfriend. You know, you're settled down. He's not out partying every night and and doing all these crazy things and neither are you. I think you've got a lot to offer, Paul, both of you. And I just wish there was some way that everyone could come together and try and sort it out. But I guess that's not going to happen, as you say. No, I think it's at this point, it's, it's out of our hands. And I mean, all of us can buy code every tour, but I don't think it's going to happen uh, objectively. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, all we can do is just hope uh, eventually they will sit down and uh, talk and figure out what's going on. But we don't know how long it's going to take and what's going to happen with pool by then. But obviously players who have federation support like Germany, Poland, Netherlands, all of them are going to stick to probably WPA because they get salary and it's pretty good money for Europe, which is not is, is it? America. I, I, I would think so. Uh, you know, if you make two, three, four thousand euros per month, you can have a good living in Europe, which is mm -hmm. not in America, right? So um, everyone who does not have any support from federation, all of them is going to stick with Mashroom because what's the point to, you know, to stick with your federation if it's not doing anything or doesn't have money to help you out or to support you? So this is how I see it. It's not about who is going to think, who thinks what's the right thing to do. Everybody's going to take care of themselves first. And I think this is the right thing to do because, again, in the end of the day, you're a professional athlete. And you have to get paid because this is your job. And this is how I think it's going to happen. Are you surviving on what you're doing and, and making in tournaments and finishing in the like the top eight most times, top four run? And, uh, yeah, I'm, in there? I'm doing good. <laughs> so I, I'm not surviving, right? I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm doing pretty good with everything I do with lessons and tournaments and you know everything that I do um but again it's because last year made me think about how can I make money aside from the prize money because I was banned from all big tournaments and obviously live in America is not cheap and you know you you get creative <laughs> with ways how you can make money and you know tournaments income is not my only income uh, so I love I love that new crystal ball you've got with that picture upside down. That's really cool, that is. I think you're very, very creative and you do, you know, you sell your your balls and merchandise and stuff like that. And you also do a lot of lessons and clinics and that kind of stuff. I just wanted to ask you quickly about the lessons that you do. Is there like a a common fault that you see with a lot of the students that you coach? Yeah, like I would say I would name couple biggest flaws okay. in everybody's like game, which is basically first and the major is just not being conscious over what they do. Like if I tell you, okay, from point A when you see the ball to point B when you stand up after execution, what happens through your brain? And it's like, well... The biggest is, okay, I decide where I want my cue ball to go. And I think about not standing up, not jumping up. And I think about maybe, you know, to not, not to jerk. This is the, this is, this is it. But there are so many other things you can pay attention on, depending on obviously what is your problem, but there's a lot. So lack of pre-shot routine, I would say it's, it's number one. But this comes from just not being conscious over what people do. Like if you say, hey, do you see you're jumping up? I didn't even notice that. But well, you, you don't notice because you don't pay attention and you're not paying attention because you're not conscious. So this is the biggest problem of a lot, a lot of pool players. Yeah, I totally agree with that. 
I don't know whether I, I remember talking to you a few years ago and I had this, I came up with this pre-shot routine because when I used to, I used to be a snooker coach back in the 80s and me and two guys that used to run the clinics had devised this pre-shot routine that, that we we coached to everyone and it really seemed to work. And I I still use it sometimes now when I can be bothered, but I just can't be bothered anymore. But, you know, I think it. I, I've spoken to a few players about it who kind of try to use it as well. So I, I'm a big believer in the... Um, in the shot routine, in the pre-shot routine, certainly. I believe most of the work is done before you even get down to the shot. Would Absolutely. you agree with that? Absolutely. I, I always say it's almost like, you know, if you're about to shoot and then you, you you stand to shoot first and then you pick up the target. This is how no, this is not how it works. You pick up the target first, you figure out okay, how far the bullet's gonna go, like or archering, or there's a lot of examples we can think mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. and you choose the target you figure out the speed the distance whatever it is and then you place your body aligning to this trajectory so it's the same in the pool but a lot of people or golf right you don't you don't go to shoot before you even think uh, what club do i need yeah how far yeah. My, my ball has to go how what speed i need to use what backswing i need to use the same thing in golf right so it's uh it's a very common mistake and, and i don't blame people it's really hard to dig 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 so deep to figure it out on your own it's it's very it happens very rarely but i think this is this is what a lot of players are lacking is pre-shot routine and just understanding how things work and you know focusing on the right things so and it's not it's not a one-time thing either you know it, it's something that no matter how many years you've been playing how good you are you still can make these elementary silly little mistakes that that yeah. so you have to be constantly reminded of it and you know okay it's much easier in the the social media time with all the smartphones and stuff where you can basically record everything you ever ever do on your phone and then you can go back and look at it afterwards but you still need somebody in your corner i believe that can keep reminding you and, and keep you kind of make it until it's absolute habit you know, it's what it's what all the great players do fedor does it of course um steve davis in snooker used to do it selby does it now o'sullivan does it where they've got this set routine and they stick to the same thing even down to taking a sip of water you know they'll be sitting in their seat their opponent misses sip of water compose yourself stand up walk to the table survey the situation chalk your cue right and you're also you're almost playing i like to say you're playing the shot in reverse you've played the positional side even before you get down you felt it you know where you're going to strike the cue ball and then all you have to concentrate on doing is putting your cue through in a straight line keep your head down follow through and if you've stood in the right place the ball must go in it can't go anywhere else right it's not it's not okay it's science to a to a degree but it's it's so important, and I'm gl really glad that you said that. And I wish more coaches would teach the pre-shot routine because it's, in my eyes, the most important part of the shot. Yeah, and it's um, this is what I'm what I was saying is focusing not on, not on on the right things because what people are focusing on is making the ball, but this is not the right thing to do because if you shoot straight and you aim right, you're gonna make the ball. So instead of just trying to make the ball, you try to create environment and the right conditions for what? For your hand to shoot straight. Because if you again, if you shoot straight and aim right, you're going to make the ball. So in a lot of times when people say, oh, you know, there's debates where you look last on the object ball and the cue ball. The, the truth is you can look anywhere because if you align right from the beginning you like all your body is supposed to be in the line so you're already aligned if i go down and my alignment is perfect like a snooker perfect and i close my eyes i shoot and i'm supposed to make the ball because i'm 
you know, it's like my gun is already on the line of the shot. And when you, you tell that to people, they, they, you know, they get mind bloated because, oh, why I never thought about this way? Be I don't know why, but I, I was thinking the same before, like always focusing on making the ball. Same thing, like focusing on winning. I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to play my best game. Now, what is what is it required for me to play my best game? Follow my push-out routine. Walk into the line. Do the same amount of warm-up strokes. Choose my shot before I go down. Choose my speed before I go down. This is what I can do to play my best. The moment I, my, my focus is sleeping on winning, this is when everything falls apart. So... It is practicing as well, focusing on the right thing. And obviously, it's not like, oh, I understand what's the right thing. Now I'm going to do it. No, it's not gonna, how it's going to work, right? It's the same practice. You're going to have to go in the tournament. You have to go and practice and think about the right thing and focusing and training your focus because it's not easy. We always tend to focus on result, making the ball, winning, beating this guy, beating this girl, you know, but it's not the right thing to do, in my opinion. I, I want to come and have a lesson with you now. <laughs> um, look, just a couple more questions on the coaching side of things. What is on your mind on your backswing? What are you thinking about on your backswing? I love your backswing, by the way. And can we, yeah, go on. What's, what, what are you thinking? What are you looking at on your final backswing? This is very personal <laughs> and it can change from time to time because I, you know, I've been working on my stroke for a long time and, and I've been working on my stroke very hard. So depending on, on what is lacking in my stroke in this period of time, this is where my focus can go. So sometimes my backswing is not straight. So when I do the backswing, I think about doing it straight. Sometimes I do it not level. So I think about, I should do my backswing level. Sometimes when I go and do my backswing, my wrist uh, tends up. So I think about if I do the backswing, my wrist is not like tight. Sometimes I do the backswing with my wrist instead of with my tricep, which will lead to not really accurate shots. So I think about when I do the backswing, I have wow. to do my tricep. So there's just one thing, right, about the backswing. And there's so many things you can think about. This is what I call being conscious about your stroke, right? So I know it's a little extra, <laughs> like it's too much sometimes. But just an example of there's a lot of things you can think of, depending of what's, where's your flaws. Wow. Now, it's, it's a well-known fact that women are way better multitaskers than men, as the saying goes, right? So here's another quick question for you. Why are women not as good as men when there's so much multitasking going on? Uh, well, first of all, I believe in stress resilience, that women not handling stress as good as men. Under the pressure, you could okay. see that women not performing as good as men. Because you can see always, majority of the time, when it's hill hill, when it's very important, there are a lot of misses, a lot of inaccuracies. When men, you, well, if it's an open position, most of the time, men is going to run out on the hill. Well, it's not always happening in women's sports. <laughs> So I believe first is a stress resilience and decision making because there are women and I think, you know, my shot making is not worse than some top men shot making purely. Right. But when it comes to decision making, uh, this is where I get a lot of questions and I can see sometimes I like watch some matches with Federer and he's like, oh, my God, this is like not the smartest thing to do. And he's explaining me why watching some women play. And I'm like, well, that makes sense. But it's like tough women playing and making silly mistakes in a decision making. And this is where I'm wondering why it's happening. Why we don't think the same way. And so is that 
lack of experience in some other games like one pocket or or we just see things differently from a I different think, perspective. I, I think I've, I've heard Kelly Fisher say that actually that women do think different to men, shot selection, stuff like that. But I also think the reason that Kelly, one of the reasons that Kelly wins so much is because she's just so resilient. She's got such a big heart and she can come back from impossible situations. And you can't teach that to anyone. It's either in your heart, the will to win and the grinding and the win at all costs. And I think that's what true champions have made of are made of. You can have everything else, right? True, but I think maybe I I mean, I don't know, but I think that it's ability to focus on the right things under a lot of pressure. Instead of thinking what's going to happen if I'm going to miss right now, no, I focus on my backswing. I focus on my pause. I focus on my pre-shot routine. This is what I think because I just, I've been in both sides. I've been with my old stroke before when I was not very conscious what I do. And I was hoping I'm going to make the ball. And my stress resilience was very poor because how can I rely on something under the stress? There has to be a backup if you fell down. So this backup is your fundamentals, basically, is your stroke, right? Is your push-out routine. So I think the ability to focus on myself instead of focusing on winning or losing, what's going to happen if is what really decides. Because I'm also reading a very interesting book is the... I don't, I don't remember the English name, but it's something about how champions think from um, a golf coach. Everything refers back to golf or tennis because it's very... Yeah, similar. absolutely. That's similar. And that's, that's, that's the same thing what he's saying in his book is that, you know, true champions never think about who is scoring faster, you know, who's, who's taking less shots to complete the, the race in golf. They focus on themselves what I'm supposed to do to play my best game. And then this is really hard to bid because when you always try to win, something doesn't go your way, you know, things change, this is game. And if you're always going to think that way, it's going to be extremely hard to focus on actually performing something, like performing the best game to win. So I think my personal opinion, uh, it's not... Obviously, it's a grind to win. She's a, she has a big heart. But also ability to, to focus on the right thing and to stop thinking, okay, this is hill-hill, not to think this is going on the hill or this is make score even. Instead of thinking about that, I'm focusing on my game. So ability to focus on the right thing. Right. I want to leave it there. I just want to go for a quick commercial break. And I just want about another 10 minutes of your time, if that's okay. So just wait right there and I'll be back in a minute. Okay. Welcome back to part two. I'm still here with Christina to catch for a little to catch up. Uh, we've covered quite a lot of stuff up till now. Welcome back, Christina. Thank you. Um, we were just talking about Kelly and the way women think differently. Are you are you basically saying that if women can maybe watch enough men's pool and maybe play more against them that could you one day be as good as men i certainly think you can be well if we look at chess they are women players athletes i'm not sure if you can say players athletes um who compete with men, which means that talking about uh, mental abilities and decision making and analyzing things, uh, we can be as good as men. Uh, again, if you play in a certain environment, if you want to learn enough and you're really 
open-minded, then I don't see why not. Good to hear. And I hope that I see it in my lifetime. I'm sure I will. Within the next 10 years, I'd love to see women competing on the same level as men. And who knows, you could be one of them. Okay, on to something else. World Team Championships this year in Puerto Rico. It was in Austria last year. Um, will Russia have a team or not? You won't. Not, not allowed to play. You're not allowed to play still. Yeah. Who do you think the team... Let's just have a little bit of a dream for now, right? Because I think you... Yeah, you... Sorry? It's a very painful dream knowing it will never come true, at least this year, so... It's more of a nightmare, isn't it? Sorry. But, look, I think you'd have... If you could play, I think it's made even worse by the fact that you could have such a good team. I mean, there's yourself, of course, as as the woman. There's, there's Fedor, who is definitely number one choice. Who would the second guy be in the team? Uh, maybe uh, Konstantin Stepanov, maybe uh, Sergei Lusker. So there are a couple options uh, because Konstantin has already a uh, US visa. This is why we considered him because at the beginning we thought we could compete. But uh, yeah, could be a couple options. Is, is Ruslan still playing, Chinnikov? Yeah, I, I mean, he... <laughs> Yeah, ish. Okay. I I love his Q action. He's one of the best players I've ever seen, Ruslan. And it's such he's a shame very, that we don't see enough of him, right? He's very talented, very natural. Yeah, very natural. Um, so not much more to talk about, really, apart from next big one for you, of course, is the World 10 Ball. How, how's your temple break? Are you practicing your temple break? Um, yeah, I've been practicing a lot, but I'm, um, you know, much most of players and uh, you know, I think w women and men's gonna break from a side. I don't think anybody's gonna break from a central table, uh, because the rack is so unpredictable when it's not a magic rack. Yeah. So I've practiced that a lot, trying to just make the one ball in the side pocket. Um, but also before I was practicing the break from a side, uh, from a center. And it's certainly hard because some people say, well, you should try to learn how to break as hard as you can and then work on your accuracy. And some people say, oh, no, you have to learn the, the movement first and figure out how it's going to, you know, how it's happening and then try to gain, gain power. So <laughs> I've been trying that and that, and it's, it's, it's really hard for me. I just, you know, not always <clears throat> able to connect my muscles. And I know that the body has to move, but it's always going too fast or <laughs> too, too, uh, too late. Prematurely then, or too late or... And it's been just a nightmare for me to to work on that because I just I'm trying really hard, but I just it's not natural, you know, for me. And I it's hard to gain a lot of power. Um, and I also am not very big <laughs> girl uh, to to put like a body power to. So it's 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 been going rough, but I'm working on that. You're you're. Going out with a, one of probably the, the best 10 ball breakers in the world. Surely he can offer a little bit of advice, can't he? Yeah, but for him, again, it's very natural. He has such a long hands and such a long bridge. So, of course, doing the backswing in you know, one mile, of course, you're going to have a lot of power. <laughs> and on top of that, uh, he has a lot more muscles than, than I do. So he can just open and close his hand and he's going to have this pop. If I'm going to do it, it's not going to be enough. I mean, I can still get a pop. If it's magic crack, I can, you know, consistently make the one ball go in a corner and have an open position. But obviously, if you 
do not play with a magic crack. You have to break as hard as you can. And it doesn't matter if you pop the cue ball or do not pop. You just have to break hard. This is where I just struggle a lot with that. Would you rather a magic wreck? Yeah, but then it's it's becoming a lot more simpler, which I, I truly enjoy playing tinball like that because there's a lot of action uh, with the cue ball, a lot of uh, moving. And <clears throat> this is definitely something I want to dig deeper in, in my pool uh, game is uh, cue ball action and maybe start playing a, a lot more one pocket to, you know, just to be more um, educated about that. Yeah, yeah, part. more knowledgeable about different shots that come up and different angles. And I'm I'm a true believer, you know, when I played snooker, I played snooker, I played English billiards, which is a fantastic game. I don't know whether you're familiar with that game, but English billiards, such a good game also. Um Obviously, I played on the smaller tables, but I love to play. I've recently started playing straight pool, not because I've got any illusions of, you know, becoming good. It's just that I enjoy it. And it, and it does teach you so many mm -hmm. different things, you know. I just want to go back to what you said about Fedor has a nice long arms and long backswing and all that. You hold a world record on your own, I think. You have the longest bridge cue overhang from your bridge than any yeah. player. Yeah. Can you learn to use the rest, the bridge, or not? I know, but it's it's on me. Obviously, I don't practice enough with the bridge because I know there's always a possibility for me to extend my cue and extend it again. <laughs> so um, I just feel more a lot more confident confident doing that. Then using the bridge, but obviously I do use the bridge uh, a lot too because I'm, um, you know, even with my uh, a mild cue, I still cannot reach uh, a lot of. <laughs> so, <laughs> have Predator made you a special extension for your cue? I was I was thinking about that uh, to do like extra, but I, I like the one that goes in between because it's not thick thickening your cue. Yeah, in the end. yeah. So because uh, sometimes I feel. You know, like Earl Strickland. I don't know if you've seen him recently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's like that. laughs> yeah, I know. He's got all sorts wrapped around it. I think he's got a tennis grip on his cue, hasn't he? Yeah. What do you think of Al? Uh, do you see his match with um, Ralph Suke? You see the hill-hill mm -hmm. battle with Ralph. He was 6-1 down and came back to hill-hill and lost 9-8 in the end. But... Uh -huh. uh, very, very entertaining game that was in the US Open, I think it was. Um, I tried trying to think what else I wanted to ask you. There was something about your doesn't matter anyway. Get practicing with that bridge, get practicing that 10 ball break. I'm not gonna be commentating in Austria. I am gonna be commentating in Puerto Rico. Well, hopefully we can share the booth at, at some stage for a couple of games maybe during Puerto Rico. It's a long event, isn't it? That should be a, a nice event. Um, but I will, I think, be in Austria anyway, just to come and watch and do some interviews with some people and stuff like that. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Oh, I know what to ask you, Christina. The Predator Chalk. Are you using the Predator Chalk? How are you finding it? I, I really like it. I used Tom. I used the green Tom before and I used for a long time Kamui. And then I switched to a uh, sniper, a uh, Ukrainian chalk because um, it just, it was a lot cleaner. Kamui was really bad, like leaving a lot of marks on a table and it was nasty. Um, so I switched to that and then Fedor introduced me to Taum, and I tried Taum, which was uh, pretty good. So now it's, it's basically the same, but the, the blue one is just a little softer, which I actually prefer even more. And it's not, again, making the table dirty at all. So I, you know, I really love, and again, I would never use anything that I don't truly like. So um, I find it pretty, pretty good. 
I mean, I think it's pretty well-known knowledge now that Taum are actually making the Predator chalk. I don't know whether you've heard that as well, but I, I, I've had it on good authority from a lot of people, and it's all over social media. I guess it's no secret. Maybe they do make it. If they do, what a smart move, I think, by Predator as well. As well. You know, why try and better something that's already out there on the market everyone's using it anyway so why not collaborate collaborate exactly well put see you're so smart you're too smart for me <laughs> so uh, i believe you have one more event for the wpba Are you playing in that it's the yes. the I doctor was... Paul classic right yeah it was a big um choice to go to Moscone to England before Christmas or go to Wisconsin <laughs> in December <laughs> but I decided to stick to my events because it's just we simply don't have enough uh, already and I don't want to miss any uh, if it's not an urgent situation so uh, yeah I'm going to play this event if it's any consolation the weather's not going to be much better in the UK and no if but it's just different. It's Christmas and it's the spirit yeah, yeah. And, London and I was planning some shopping. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, Oxford Street in December. No better place in the world to be than Oxford Street around Christmas. It really but, is yeah, something special. For a couple of days after uh, flight, but we're still trying to decide our plans and should we go to have a vacation in a hot country or Oxford Street. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what are you up to for the rest of today? What's on your What's on your agenda today? Just practicing and walk my 10,000 steps and just have a dinner and watch some games and read my daily routine every day. So you'll be watching... Fedor, he's playing the last 32 tomorrow, isn't it, I believe? Yes, I just watch a lot of different matches on YouTube and, um, you know, putting in my little notebook uh, the shots that I come in the morning and I, you know, set the same positions and trying to um, uh, play them and see how, how they played because it's a lot more chances you're going to remember that shot if you're going to actually play it yourself, so... So how's the notebook going? Are you still, the workbook, are you still producing them, still selling them? Where can people buy them? Tell us where they can buy them. Just message me directly. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't put it in a website because it's just a lot of work and, you know, it's too much, too much work. So I, I decided to just sell them uh, like that through my social media. So anytime. Isn't this a great sport? You know, you can talk to top players in the world. I mean, I've got you, I'm now at my home in England, just sitting here talking with one of the top female players in the world. I can message Fedor, I can message Jason, I can message anyone. What other sport can you do that in? It's just not possible, is it? I don't know. I have never tried to message anyone from different sports uh, to know. Um... But I assume if you were more or less around this, um, from this, um, let's say, area. The um, circle, yeah. The same yes. sort of circle, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it really is a lovely sport where you can walk in the arenas and walk around the US Open and and see all these great players and have a selfie with them and have an autograph and have a chat. Well, because it's pool. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> It's pool and it's not, you know, players is, is not a big deal like in any other sports. You know, if you try to do something like that in tennis or golf, obviously it's not going to be the same because, you know, athletes are a big deal there. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get there one day. Hope so. So when are you going to be on Joe Rogan? I think it's about time Joe had a, a female on Joe Rogan, don't you? I don't know if he's into females pool players at all we'll see well i think you should be the first one on there he's fedor has been on there svb's been on there it's about time you went on i think and uh, no not svb who was on the other who was it aj 
JJ, Jeremy. sorry, yeah, Jeremy was on there. That's right, yeah, sorry. Oh, it was uh, Shane was on 60 Minutes, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that. I knew he was inviting, uh, inviting uh, Earl, but he rejected every single time. So hopefully, you know, I would like to see <laughs> Earl in a podcast with Joe. Uh, it would be pretty... Yeah, I, I see uh, Earl has started doing his weekly kind of question and answers on uh, at the Sandcastle, Ed Ladawi's place. I see he's been doing some uh, Q&As on there. Have you seen any of those? He's hilarious. Mm -mm. He's great. Okay, well, you're great as well. So good luck. Have a lovely day there. Where are you now? Home. On the farm? On the f home, on the farm, yeah. <laughs> have, you been, have you been driving the tractor today or cutting yeah. the grass? <laughs> okay, look, Christina, thank you so much. Good luck in, in Austria. I'll, I'll hopefully see you there. And uh, get working on that break. And then, of course, the Puerto Rico for the ladies, the ladies' temple there, right? For the, the Pro Billiard Series, yeah? Okay. Thank you. So anyone else you want to shout out to? Any of your sponsors? Just shout out to my sponsors, as always, Spreader and The Zone. So thank you so much, guys, for the support. But they know. <laughs> so... <laughs> And now we know. Thanks ever so much for your time, Christina. Thank you. Good luck. And I'll see you for another to catch up in a couple of months, maybe. After Sounds Christmas, good. yeah? I'll find out what you did over Christmas. Moscone or shopping? <laughs> Sounds okay. good. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.